it takes usually about 30 seconds or shit so for it to actually go live we tend to look we got there's another screen going as well jeremy so it's not that we're not listening we're just looking at the chats and things right like right that. trying to <laughs> yeah yeah yes yeah, so if you make any dramatic hand signals i i want to I won't see him always, <laughs> but we okay. should be live. So welcome anyone who's hops in. We normally give it a few seconds for uh, people to show up. So we're not uh, preaching into the void, but welcome once again. I'll open up the chat if it's working. The past few weeks, the chat has not been functioning very well in the beginning. So hopefully that'll change this time. So One someone... of the things that I've, uh, sorry, I just was jumping in. One of the things that I've noticed about the chat is uh, if you adjust the lag time on the chat, so when I was doing live streams, it was like a 40 second lag. And so um, mm. it, that really is disruptive. Yeah. Um, but, uh, or maybe it's like the delay of your video posting, I forget, but they were really out of sync. But if you can shorten it up, I was on a live stream a couple of days ago with somebody else and they had theirs, like you could almost type to them and have them answer in real time. Nice. Um, which is uh, a lot nicer than having a big delay. Yeah, there does seem to be a bit of a delay with like the actual video and then it's showing up on YouTube. I don't know if that is purposeful or something that I can adjust, but um, definitely I'll see if I can. It's not obvious if it is, <laughs> but welcome one, everyone. So what would you like to cover tonight, Che? I think you you set, you, uh, set this up. You guys have met before, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, indirectly through a... a a primitive skills gathering called Harvest Gathering. It's probably where I met Jeremy four or five years ago, something like that. And yeah. one of these sorts of events where it's uh, it really sort of encompasses everything, primitive survival skills, bushcraft related. So I had a natural attraction to it. And Jeremy actually gave me a big bag of acorn uh, flour. <laughs> okay. Nice. And he, he taught some events there. I taught some events and that went on and, you know, connected with him at, at uh, Headwaters, Headwaters Gathering and other events like that. So uh, just one of these, you know, sort of unique, intelligent individuals that is very passionate. <laughs> and Thanks. A lot of stories to tell. You know what? I want to start. Let's go back to that, to the fishing story. Yeah, that was good. I like okay. that one. Right off sure. the back. I remember seeing a photo. I was trying to track down the article for it because you guys were on the canoe. And anyway, so bring it, take it from the top, Jeremy. This is a fantastic story. Sure. Well, I think the, the photo is probably in the Port Hope Times, uh, which is the publication for Port Hope. Um, and the backstory there is that uh, my friend Chris and I and another friend Scott, we'd all made plans to meet up and go salmon fishing because Port Hope um, in the, where the Ganaraska River is, uh, has quite the salmon run. And um, as we were making plans to go, the town was making plans to shut down um, the opportunity for, for salmon fishermen to come. So the town was very worried about uh, thousands of people showing up for the salmon run and bringing all of Toronto's dirty COVIDs with them uh, to, their, to their little picturesque town. And um, they, they didn't themselves have the authority to shut down the fishing season or to shut down um, the water. But what they did do is uh, they, they made an announcement. They shut down all the municipal land and trails adjacent to the river and, um, and put up, they had it all taped off like with caution tape and, and made it very, very clear that there was to be no one crossing um, by land, which, um, to most people's minds effectively shut down the river. Now what they did do is they left the boat launch open so people could still go and fish in the lake. And what Chris and I did is, um, uh, and we didn't go with Scott that time, we went with him on a different trip, but we, he and I went down with a canoe and we launched the canoe and then we just paddled ourselves upstream and, um, and circumvented their, uh, their river shut down. And awesome. we had uh, the whole river to ourselves. So I don't know if I'd never really been salmon fishing before, but what I've heard is that people literally are shoulder to shoulder doing like synchronized casting oh, well. to fit everybody on the river. And then when someone catches a fish, like everybody pulls up because you got to wait for this guy to fight, fight this big fish or you all get tangled. And we were literally the only people with rods in the water the, the whole length of the river. And, um, and it was amazing. But, you know, because of that, we also were a bit of a spectacle. 
Uh, so I told you guys, like people were people were crossing the boundaries to come to the water to shout at us to tell us that we weren't allowed to be there, and you know, and the river's noisy, and we're trying to say like, no, we're allowed to be here. You can't cross that line. And um, of course, eventually the police got involved. So uh, you know, we're we were busy working with this one fish that we just caught, and and you can't hear anything because the water's right there. And then all of a sudden, somebody was shouting at us about uh, not being allowed to be there, and. So we explained, stated our case, explained whose authority it was that, you know, the town employs the police officers and tells them to keep people out of the river, but it's actually the rivers managed by a different authority. And, um, and in Ontario anyway, depending on who you talk to, the definition of the river, that's actually like the high water mark to the high water mark. So even when we're standing, and this is a beef they had with us that we were standing on the rocks. So technically we weren't in the river uh and we're like no actually this it's the river bed it is the river you, you can't make us get off the rocks because the river <laughs> yeah, high water flows here so it's it's part of the river and, um so those guys they let us go but then the funny thing is they sent two more cops uh to try and you know or they just were miscommunicating but then other police officers came and they tried to run us off and they were not <laughs> as nice as the first two guys that we talked to um who were who were at least willing to discuss um and they're like yeah well we'll see you guys in court and then <laughs> and, and then they kind of walked away and then, you and know like, for well, like weeks every so time we i checked the, <laughs> yeah every time i check the mail right it's like am i gonna get a ticket am i gonna get cited like no so not. how far upstream did you have to travel to get to that spot and how quick was the current oh it's it's not that fast we actually did more dragging our canoe than paddling it because the river is quite shallow um but we had to use the canoe to get from the launch to the shallow part of the river i would say it was uh certainly less than a kilometer from the launch okay. to get to the good part of the river and so then you didn't have to like know, paddle furiously against no, this raging no, current no. we just <laughs> we literally were like walking with the canoe in our hand <laughs> that's awesome and then um and then they got mad because we pulled our canoe up on the rocks so they were like you're not in the river um <laughs> like no it's it still counts as the river, so that's awesome. Uh, thank you. I'm live on the internet. I gotta, gotta, gotta love a good loophole. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So was there like there were angry people on the on the on the banks and they're basically yelling at you, standing there watching you fish. Yeah, the odd one uh, was you know would would was shouting to us i don't know that they were shouting at us but they were shouting to us like some of them probably thought they were doing us a favor favor some of them were probably angry that we were breaking the law right. as they <laughs> saw it um there was a reporter there and you know we tried we tried to communicate with him but he couldn't cross to talk to us and we couldn't cross to talk to him unless he wanted to come up the canoe launch or the boat launch so they ended up doing a story uh that had us pictured in it and and spoke about us um <laughs> And, it, you know, of course, the way that the, he framed it, because he never actually talked to us, it's like, and they brought cameras to document their interaction with the police. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, we brought cameras to document catching fish. <laughs> and uh, and we and I specifically did not film the police. We, we did not aim cameras at them. We happened to have a camera running at one point when they came to talk to us. Um, but that was we did not go out of our way to uh, make trouble with them uh, or showcase them. And, and I said specifically, like, they don't know where the line is and um it happened to be a holiday monday so you also we couldn't get a hold of a conservation officer we couldn't get a hold of the toronto region conservation authority so you know i think it really just came down to a supervisor making a call a judgment call on uh, our information and his information and and then uh, we never really heard anything else about it after that that's such a great story <laughs> something from the bio on trifecta.com uh, 2019, Jeremy undertook the big wild year, 365 days of eating only wild foods. The project includes through uh, thorough physiological and blood chemistry measurements, documenting the health impacts of such a lifestyle intervention. So you lived for a year eating only foods that you gathered. Um, what was the hardest part about that? Uh, I think, you know, there, there were a, a few hardest parts about that. Um, 
So, you know, one of the hardest things was um, the foods that we stopped eating. So, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, that's interesting. You're eating wild food. I'm like, yep. Uh, also, you know, we're not drinking alcohol and we are not drinking coffee. And then it's like, what? <laughs> well, I couldn't give up coffee. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's already bad. I was like, well, I guess I could eat bear every day if I had to, but I, mean, I couldn't give up coffee. Uh, so the giving up stuff was, was, um, was difficult. Uh, getting, getting enough variety of things in bulk, like, because everything's seasonal. Uh, we're so removed from that in grocery stores because they managed to bring us bananas like every day of the week and right. they're never out of season. But um, when you're targeting uh, wild foods, they're often they're, they're there for like a week and then they're gone or they're past the picking point. And so, you know, being keeping on our toes and managing to hit all those things when they were abundant, you know, while still working our jobs and taking care of our children was um, that was a big challenge. Then, so was, uh, he was hunting as well, right? Not just like uh, like uh, wild edibles. No, yeah, we hunted uh, pretty much everything that we could for that in that year, and and in the year leading up, we stockpiled some food, so we had like a full freezer before we started. Um, I don't know where you are, Eric, but we have like five months of winter and kind of limited uh, hunting opportunities in the winter time, so we we stocked up in advance. Yeah. Um, yeah, we hunted, we fished, we did a little bit of trapping, uh, and lots of picking nice yeah wow yeah well, and then like just you know I, I felt like I was really skilled before we started that but you really learn about what you don't know when you have to rely on you know because it's one thing like um, Che you were saying I gave you a bunch of acorns at uh, Harvest Gathering you know and you, you you dry them and you crack them and you grind them and you leach them and you know that's fun and you make some pancakes but then when you're staring at 60 pounds of acorns uh, all at once and you're, and you're, I don't even have enough room in my house to dry 60 pounds of acorns, right? Like I don't even know where to put them all. I need like trays. I need bags hanging to with air going through them. And um, then you, you really realize that, you know, when those things are in quantity, it's a whole other story than uh, just picking for fun or picking to try it out or to, to try a new skill. That was a challenge. The question yeah. from uh, Mark Olson here. If you do have any questions, please ask them all the uh, He says, rabbits, what kind of trapping, what kind of animals did you trap? Sure. So uh, this goes back to like the loophole thing again, because I only became a licensed trapper uh, a couple months ago. And this uh, year happened in 2019. So um, we were using loopholes that allowed us to trap nuisance animals on private property uh, with live traps and then like subsequently dispatch them. So that's how I got into a bunch of raccoons. Um, I snared a lot of hares, a lot of snowshoe hares. What do you think of raccoon? I like raccoon. Really? Uh, yeah. I raccoon is like, if you took like a, like a pork and a chicken, uh, and put them together, you'd have a raccoon. I think, um, it's hmm. like sort of dark meat, but not really dark meat. It's sort of greasy, but you know, depending on how you cook it or how you, how much fat you take off of it. Um, and the big bonus with the raccoons is because uh, you're accessing enough fat is a challenge when you're eating a wild diet. Um, and, uh, and we were counting on bear fat and the, and the bears that we harvested happened to not have a lot of fat on them. So we ended up eating almost as much um, raccoon fat as bear fat, rendered raccoon fat. I have yet to eat raccoon. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if you get a chance and the person who's harvesting it and cleaning it knows what they're doing, I would say like, uh, by all means, try it out. Right on. Yeah. They were all over the place back in Florida, but I live out in Vegas now and there's not too many raccoons running. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then I've had them, I've had dispatched one here and it's, it was greasy. It was fat. I didn't like it. Maybe I got to try a North Bay, a North Bay raccoon. Yeah, well, your raccoons down there are probably like corn fed, apple fed <laughs> raccoons, right? Yeah, they're just like <laughs> garbage. Have you seen that video that the guy, some old guy on his porch with a bag of like a whole bin of hot dogs? Yeah. And yeah, he's, yeah. Fe he's feeding like a hundred, like a hundred fat ass <laughs> raccoons. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty amazing little animals. Yeah, they're, they're smart. Um, the hard thing about raccoons is that when when the hunting season's open for them they're typically very very fat and uh and i always kind of describe it like 
the first one we had, we had this big fat raccoon and so I skinned it and then it looks like a kind of a cat inside of a marshmallow. <laughs> And then if it's warm out, it's like super greasy, slippery. But if it's really cold out, it's a little bit firmer. But you got to get all that fat off, which, of course, we saved and rendered. Um, and then once you get all the fat off, it just kind of looks like a cat. Um, and then you, you finish your processing and you've got your fat in one pile and the meat in the other. And um, after we had gone through that process with one or two raccoons, Delphine said, I don't think I'm going to be able to eat these after, actually. <laughs> So we stopped hunting and trapping raccoons. And then, um, you know, we kind of got to that point in the year where we we're eating all of our wild food and it, we got to the raccoons and she's like, okay, I think I'm ready to try it. And then it, it ended up being one of our favorites for the year. And we're like, ah, we should have trapped more of them at the start. <laughs> uh, but they are, they're not super easy to handle. And um, there are tricks you're, you're supposed to look for and remove glands that some of which are a little bit hard to find. And um in my experience and in Chris's experience, like on different raccoons, like he and I have found the glands, not found the glands, old raccoons, young raccoons, and then we cook them all up and we don't notice a difference in taste. Um, so I don't know how important it is to remove those glands or if they're just really specific to like a breeding season or an age of the raccoon, but interesting. It's, apparently it's important to remove them. I wonder if it has something to do with what they've been eating as well, too. Like someone mentioned dumpster fed raccoons in the chat, yeah, yeah. too. So if they're eating like trash versus, you know, totally wild natural diet, maybe that. Yeah. Help. I mean, even like a raccoon that's eating trash is still it's really just eating what you eat. Right. Like it's eating your leftover chicken wings and your carrot peelings and your like it's probably well, not your trash. Yeah. But a lot of trash is not and what people eat is not really good. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> just pizza crusts and uh, little like. Right. The scrapings from the inside of their dipping containers or whatever. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so what instigated this this challenge that you wanted to do the, for a year, just purely uh, wild harvested food? Well, uh, we'd been watching the TV series alone, which I think you probably both have watched that TV series. Or familiar yeah, with yeah. it. So they drop people off and they have mm -hmm. to survive alone. They have a limited number of items, and um, almost by almost always after like 35 days, they're, they're starved out or they've gone mad um, and people last longer uh, and, you know, up to like whatever, 80 or 90 days, I forget who's holding the record right now, but uh, you know, we were just constantly amazed that these people were not able to keep themselves out of uh, like anorexia um, or like, I guess it, anorexics or maybe when you're not eating. So they're eating every day, but you know, they're just not getting enough food. And so, you know, we thought, well, it's got to be able to, you got to be able to eat wild food and thrive because presumably like all of our ancestors for hundreds of generations right. did it. So, it <laughs> right. so let's do it. You know, we just decided let's do it. And like, well, how long do we have to do it to prove a point? Like, let's do a whole year is uh -huh. what it came down to. And so uh, that's what we did. Oh, oh, awesome. year of eating wild food. That's mm. awesome. What's the first thing that you ate? when you were like the next whatever it was that evening or the next morning <laughs> yeah we did a live stream on uh, new year's eve uh so you mean the, the first day that we were done the big wild year or the first day we started first day well we'll start with both we'll do both first day you started well, I, I can't remember the first day we started probably was dandelion root coffee um and probably bear meat and like dandelion greens and fiddleheads and wild leeks and things like that um in the first why why do you keep coming over to interrupt me sorry i got kids here um no worries good night monkeys um so the first day after or the new year's eve at the end where we counted down to midnight then you know we had everything we had there was like pie and cake and cookies and alcohol and and I, I kind of meant to just like ease back into my old diet. <laughs> like then, binged on it all, just went nuts. Yeah, it's like once, we, <laughs> once I started, I couldn't stop. And, um, and that was too bad because I, uh, I was feeling really, really good most of the year eating just wild food and noticed lots of good health changes. And um, like my, my skin is like super inflamed right now. And, uh, and it was like that before the big wild year. And um, during the big wild year, I had like really healthy skin. Wow. Um, we couldn't get sunburns. We noticed that we had like, I don't, I, don't, I can't really explain it, but we had like natural 
uh, UV insensitivity or something. I've heard that from people who, specifically people who tried carnivore, like exclusive carnivore diets, have, really? re- have reported that they've been really resistant to sunburns, actually. Yeah. I, so would, I'm, I would love to talk some more about that. Yeah. I'm, I mean, that's uh, not personal point. experience. I've just heard that anecdotally. But I want, I, my guess would be that, especially because of your experience, that it's much more related to something that's been eliminated from the diet than something that's been added to it, you know, like some seed yeah. oils or something that are really bad for us that are in a lot of modern foods. Yeah, but, yeah. Or but like, specifically uh, carnivore I, diet. I was, so, yeah. I was eating pretty carnivore for most of that year too, because um, it's easier to get meats than uh, right. than veggies in my part of the world. So that's uh, interesting. Yeah, I wonder about that. Probably yeah, for sure. Lot. Like we definitely were like, you know, we went out in the canoe one day and then we were longer than we meant to, like in our bathing suits, so like, oh my God, we are going to burn. <laughs> and then, and we got a tan, like it was like, oh, this is something's amiss, like something's right. weird. <laughs> and then we, so then we lay out in the sun and like, you just feel it beating down on you. Like, oh, like, <laughs> no, nope, I think I burnt. I got to stop. I think I burnt. And then we, you know, no burn. Like, oh, that's awesome. weird. Yeah, it was very strange. Yeah. I want to. I'm going to go more into the, the health benefits. Uh, I've got a question from Destiny. What did you eat on Thanksgiving? That's the question. Do, do you even remember what you ate on Thanksgiving? It's it's on the Big Wild Year Facebook page. Uh, we, we posted meals, like, I'm not going to say every day, but most days. If you scrolled through to Thanksgiving of 2019 on the Big Wild Year page, we might have had a wild turkey. Um, nice. That, uh, and I wish I could say that we shot it, Eric, but um, <laughs> the uh, the only two turkeys we got that year were both roadkills. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and, and had to have a little bit of gravel to pick them. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's kind of like pulling out the, the shot pellets. Right. It's same thing, right? It's <laughs> gravel. Road gravel. Yeah. <laughs> Flex of paint. Yeah. Uh, a little bumper. Yeah. It might have been. Um, it might have been turkey. It might have also been a goose. I think we had a couple of geese that year, and we might have had a Thanksgiving goose. Awesome. Mm-hmm. There's another question mm-hmm. someone had back here: is what is your thoughts on rat traps as a useful survival tool for trapping? I I haven't used them a lot yet, um, but I suspect uh, after having taken my trapping course and reading a little bit of this and that uh, that rat traps pound for pound might be one of your best uh, best food getters, except that all the food that you catch with rat traps are smallish and not right. very calorie rich. So, you know, for squirrels and pigeons, I think rat traps can work amazing. Um, you know, and that depends on the legality in your state or province. In, in Ontario, you can't trap red squirrels unless you're a licensed trapper. Uh, but pigeons, I've heard that the best way to catch pigeons is to like wire a little bit of corn right onto the pan and then uh, sprinkle a little bit of corn around it and they come and then they peck the pan or they try and pick up that corn and it's that glued one to the kernel. pan and then yeah. you, know, you catch them <laughs> by the neck. Yeah. So, you know, I've heard that for pigeons, it works really well. Um, and squirrels. Yeah, that, that would be my thought is that I know those traps just for rats and whatnot obviously work really well, but you're limited size wise. So what type of traps did you use most of like cone bear traps, wire snares? Yeah, well, for um, for snowshoe hares in Ontario, you're only allowed to use wire snares of like 20 to 22 gauge wire, brass mm-hmm. wire, so that we used a lot of snares for snowshoe hares. And, um, and actually, I think one of your best traps, easiest to use, uh, easiest to maintain is a, a live trap. If you get like a medium sized live trap that'll hold like a small dog, you can catch anything in there, especially raccoons, but you can set it under underwater almost like you could set it for muskrats you could set it for rats uh, and the nice thing is if you catch what you want it's it's okay in there for a couple days because it's in a live trap um and if it's not what you want you can let it go like i caught a fisher by accident one day i took a video oh, of wow. that um and uh and i just released him because i was trying to catch a raccoon and i did not want to catch uh, and keep a fisher um and they're bulky uh but i think like if you've got a a spot where you are live traps are made you catch birds with them um kind of third i think they're kind of universally really really versatile they're just bulky yeah they do take a lot of space yeah 
Excellent. That Maybe makes sense. Beginning. I've got uh, two links for you in the chat window. One for the Big Wild Year Facebook page. So I think right. it was Big FD. Is it FB? My bad. Uh, and Jeremy's YouTube channel as well. And I would highly suggest you subscribe to that. If you have any questions, for sure. Them. Thanks. And after after this, if you're not watching live, I'll have the links in the description below too as well. So if you're watching this later, I will add those as well. I sent you some, an email there, uh, Eric, with, with some photos. Let me see if I can get it to work. I was having trouble opening the pictures before, but we'll see what I can do. While you're doing that, what was your calorie intake daily? What happened to you physiologically? You talked about susceptibility or less, or more immune to sun to the sun. But did you did you lose muscle mass? Did you lose the belly fat? Yeah. Did you... Yeah, yeah. So um, the 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 sunburning thing was like an anecdotal uh, note, and the skin health was anecdotal. Um, you know maybe you haven't noticed this, but as you uh, get into your middle years, you get like weird little aches and pains or you get like that one ankle that cracks all the time. Um, a lot of those things kind of disappeared for us, which was interesting as well. Uh, partly maybe because we lost a ton of weight. So I'm looking at um, my measurements. So in December of 2018, right before the big wild year, I weighed uh, 88 Point one kilograms, which is 194 pounds, and I'm six feet and a fraction of an inch. Wow! Um, so actually, and as far as BMI goes, that was a BMI of about 26.4, okay. which is the overweight category. Uh, by July. I, I was down at 71.9 kilograms, which is like a 156 pounds ish. Wow. Uh, and a BMI of 21.5, which is the normal category and carries no additional risk of heart disease. Um, so it was a really dramatic drop. Like in, uh, in those four months, we, we experienced almost all of our changes within the first four months and then basically maintained them through the whole rest of the year. Uh, I did gain a little bit of weight after that point. Um, and I think that's partly because uh, we started we started buying wild rice uh, as, a, as a staple for our diet uh, in June, um, just because it was really hard to, to get enough carbs in our diet. We were, we were eating a lot of meat um, and um, green, greens and berries uh, but we didn't have like a staple carbohydrate and um so we decided to and it and it's kind of weird like um 156 pounds uh that felt really light to me that was like that's like a high school weight for me like a like a skinny high school weight almost um but that's still like a normal bmi for my height that's not i wasn't like medically skinny but it just like relative to my previous body weight that felt extreme and then that was kind of worrying and so we jumped onto the wild rice to bulk up a little bit and that, and that seemed to do the trick we did maintain or gain a little bit of weight through the year but um even though i lost a lot of weight uh my i got i'm just sort of scrolling through my data here so i've got some percent body fat measurements as well and <clears throat> percent body fat. So at the start of the year, it was 26, sorry, 23% body fat. Uh, and then by the middle of the year, it was uh, just under 17% body fat. So even at that 156 pounds, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't even emaciated. at like, yeah. I wasn't even at fight weight, right? Like what do people, right. people are like looking for 12% body fat so they can flash their six pack at people. And, right. uh, and I wasn't even there, even though I'd lost a lot of weight. Uh, we measured strength so um, at the start of the year, I was doing 258 kilogram, uh, one rep max for a leg press, which is uh, at that time was 2.95 times my body mass uh, as a ratio. And then in 
uh, at the end of the year, I did a single rep leg press of 292 kilograms. So I went from 258 kilograms at my fat weight. And then I pressed uh, one leg press 292. So even more weight uh, at my low body fat. Nice. So the, the ratio, like by the ratio of my body weight, I did yeah. a 2.95 and then it went up to 3.85, which was like a huge strength per pound increase. Although, you know, my overall strength increased a little bit, but my strength per pound, cause I dropped a lot of fat. Yeah. So um, your, I think it's your Wilk score. They call that when you based on your body weight and everything that would have gone up actually. Okay. Which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Some, uh, we had a question. Do you use a refrigerator or freezer at all for the, for your food or what did you try to store it in exclusively wild methods as well? No. So we were, um, we were like, modern hunter gatherers i would say uh so we were using every uh bit of technology to our advantage advantage hunting with you know rifles and scopes um using modern fishing gear traveling around again gasoline powered vehicles although we certainly did a lot of hiking and um, canoeing and stuff like that but uh, we made extensive use of our fridge and freezer although we also um did some canning uh some dry goods storage so things that could be dried, we dried. Things that could be canned, we canned. Uh, lots of dried mushrooms, and um, but uh, all our vegetables, basically, we froze them, and all of our meat was frozen. Okay, cool. I've got these uh, pictures that Chase sent me up, so I'm gonna pop those up on the screen, and you can talk us through what we're looking at. Sure. Yeah, they're this. not um, they're not specific to the big wild deer, although that one okay. is. That's a rainbow trout. Okay. That's a little rainbow trout that I caught. Um, fishing and I was so happy to catch that little rainbow trout and then I don't know if I sent the picture with the big rainbow trout but after I caught this little one I caught one that was like I don't know how many pounds six seven eight pounds um a real big one uh but that's like we were out fishing all the time we were fishing for pike for bass for perch for trout for nice burbot for we ate a lot of um channel catfish there's a uh, two rivers near me that were, at, were really far north for channel catfish, but um, a few years ago, somebody uh, shared a spot with me and uh, we ate a lot of channel catfish. Awesome. Here, we, what do we got next? So we got, looks like wild mushrooms. Yeah, those, Some are the, morals. Um, those are the Verpa Bohemica, the early or the half free morels. Maybe I got the, the name wrong on those. But, um, those are the early morels that come up before the Morkella. Uh, but that one yellow one uh, on the top left of the basket, that would be like a true yellow morel. So um, I ended up spending quite a bit of time trying to learn how to shoot a turkey with uh, a new friend, um, Steve uh, Lukacic, who, uh, has, who has been out on a few adventures with me. And, uh, Sorry to interrupt. I hate to interrupt, but can we just, is it just me or we check the audio there on your, on your side, Jeremy? I can hardly hear you. Yeah. Uh, how about now? Is that a little bit better? Am I've I been able to hear for the most part. I haven't noticed yeah. anything. Sorry, man. Please okay. continue. No, you know what? Um, I let my kids use my laptop, and uh, they've destroyed the earphone jack by, mm -hmm. like, walking away from it with their earbuds plugged in or whatever the case is. <laughs> so if yeah, you do yeah. have a hard time hearing me, let me know. I just, like, wiggle it, and then it works. Um, but I might have bumped it there. Yeah, so just I was saying I was out with um, Steve Lukacic, and he's a great, fantastic resource in Ontario for anybody who wants to learn about Ontario mushrooms. He's got a very active Instagram account. Um, Stevie Funfur is his handle, Stevie right on. underscore Funfur. But, um, but we did a lot of mushrooming, and uh, tried, he tried to teach me how to shoot a turkey, and uh, we did not get a turkey, but we did score lots of wild mushrooms, nice. lots of wild leeks. Yeah, yeah. Well, mushrooms are interesting because I, I think they're delicious, but from a like a nutritional perspective, they have a lot of minerals and, and uh, nutrients in them, but almost no calories. So, yeah. you know, if you were really starving in the woods, they probably wouldn't help a whole lot. <laughs> no, some of them have a fairly high protein um, content by dried weight, but okay. like you're talking about Pound they whatever, lose like 99 yeah. percent of their wet weight so you know you really right. uh, have a pretty low amount but they also just add a nice diversity and um at right. some times of the year when you go out foraging they're sort of one of the only things that you're going to find in abundance so they're um you get a pretty good feeling about finding that many morels at once right 
All right, here we got another stash of mushrooms. Yeah, so aside from mushrooms, uh, we targeted, we probably ate, um, I kept I kept track, I think maybe 14 different species or more of mushrooms in the big wild year. So uh, specifically in this picture, there are puffballs at the top. The ones above the puffballs are, uh, maybe they were turkey tails or something that we picked as we were trying to figure out if they were turkey tails. So there's a bunch of buff balls in the top left, uh, birch boletes in the top right. The yellow guys in the middle are yellow chanterelles. Uh, there's a couple of oyster mushrooms in the bottom right. And those funny gray ones to the left above my mm -hmm. knife are uh, jelly hedgehogs, which nice. um, are super fun to find, but they've got like, they're all water. I, I don't know if you right. get anything out of them. <laughs> So mushrooms specifically are something a lot of people are worried about getting the wrong ones. Is there not just mushrooms, but that just made me think of it. Is there anything throughout the year that you messed up, got the wrong one, got sick, anything like that? Uh, yes and no. So I would say like people should be worried about mushrooms and they should definitely uh, use more than a pocket guide in identifying them. Like find somebody who knows or like join a group where somebody um, can can like definitively say yes that's safe to eat or no it's not and no even then like even the ones that are commonly eaten some people are just not going to react well to them mm. uh, the same as that you know some people just don't react well to different foods um so uh, i might have poisoned myself with mushrooms once and not from eating the wrong kind but from being uh I don't want to say greedy, but like just eating ones that weren't really in the best kind of shape, but just not being uh, able to throw them away. Yeah. Cause I, I found them and I picked them and I, you know, I'm, <laughs> by God, I'm going to eat them. Right. Uh, but we also, you know, we ate mushrooms and minnow soup. And uh, so that might've not been a good combo. Those minnows might've been not palatable or safe. Right on. <laughs> either. Um, I did uh, poison myself pretty good with milkweed pods. Oh yeah. They're a very common edible. And, um, if you boil them twice, you're fine. And what happened to me is I, I steamed them and I froze them. And then when I went to cook them, uh, I forgot that I hadn't pre-boiled them twice. And I just put them into a stew. And then I ate a lot of the stew. I ate like, I think I figured out I ate 40 milkweed pods um, all in, in one go. And I was very ill. Wow. <laughs> uh, I haven't thrown up that hard in, in a really, really long time. Rough. Yeah. So here, this picture, you're out hunting something, it looks like. Yeah. Uh, in that picture, I was trying out, um, so that's a, a, a Valmet 12-gauge uh, over 222 Remington that I got because I thought it was the world's best go-anywhere, do-anything <laughs> combo foraging uh, gun. And I bought an adapter made by... Um, a guy in, uh, in Alaska, uh, MCA bullet company, he makes adapters. And so I actually was testing out shooting 22 long rifle in the 222 Remington barrel. And I hmm. found it to be like super accurate. And, uh, I've done a lot of hunting. I harvested my first bear with that gun. I had a, uh, 4570 insert dropped into the 12 gauge barrel and, um, shot my bear with that. Nice. There you go, bow hunting skills as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like to um, do a little bit of shooting. I, I shot compound for a while, but never really hunted much with it, except for carp derbies. And then uh, I picked up this recurve bow, and uh, my friend um, Jay Valenti, who's got uh, the YouTube channel and Etsy store Vision Quest Outdoors, he made these... Uh, authentic arrows for me so they're stone tipped which is now legal for hunting in ontario stone tipped wow. arrows as long as they're a certain dimension um and uh sinew wrapped and turned wild turkey feathers and and uh, so i went out and did a little bit of shooting with that and um i've only i've been moose hunting with that bow but we never got shooting at any moose but i um shot a pot pile of rocked grouse with it and spruce grouse excellent speaking of bear yeah there's one of my bears. That bear, um, so the Wooded Beardsman and I were doing a seven day uh, wilderness living challenge. It was season two of the wilderness living challenge. He's um, filmed a few seasons of, of these adventures. And the, the funny story there is we had gotten a friend to help us. He's a licensed trapper. So we trapped two beavers and we were basically gonna eat these beavers and 
and get fat over seven days while uh, camping and foraging for other foods. And he dropped his camera in the lake. And, oh. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we're like, what are we going to do? Cause I, I, I didn't have a YouTube channel or a camera then. Right. Um, and he's like, Oh, this is like, we can't, this is, this is all such good material. We can't lose this. So I drove uh, an hour and a half more two hours i drove to um the nearest city that had a camera shop with a good camera and i bought the camera that i've been using um for uh youtube videos ever since so i was like well i'll buy a camera because i've been meaning to <laughs> and then we'll finish we'll finish with my camera and then you can buy a new camera when we finish this week and uh and that's uh that's what we did but but when i was driving back i found a roadkill bear so like, what are the chances? So, um, so I got back to our camp and, uh, and he came across the lake with the canoe to meet me. And I was like, Hey, I got something to show you. <laughs> and I had a bear in the back of my vehicle. And, uh, and then it just became a lot of work after that. We, we skinned this bear, we skinned two beavers. We were trying to smoke everything over a fire, keep the bugs from getting at it right. and trying to eat as much of it as we could. And, <laughs> Pretty wild. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, Fun times. Time. Wow. So it sounds like you're... I was just going to show the camera again because Eric had the screen superimposed. Oh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. If you want to hold up your yeah, camera. I yeah. yeah, I guess. Yeah, you don't always see... Because people are shooting with their camera, you don't always see what camera they are using. It's um, it's a Sony, it's a camcorder camera. Um, it shoots 4K and I just got a road mic and a dead cat to go on the microphone and um, so if you've ever wondered what I do all these videos with, it's all with this camera, which is three, nice. three years old now. It's been out at like minus 30. It's been out in the rain. It's been burnt beside the fire. It's been everywhere. Um, and I'm really surprised how well it's held up. Awesome. Yeah. Someone says, what size is the knife? I'm assuming they're referring to the spider co that was in the. Oh yeah. The Mannix. Uh, it's like, it's a, like a regular size pocket folder. You could look up the dimensions online of a spider co Mannix. I'm not actually sure. Okay. Uh, it's not so an don't... oversized knife though. Yeah. I guess we're trying to size, size the mushrooms based yeah. off the knife. Yeah. Like, is that a lot of mushrooms or not? Right. A lot of mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> the knife is like this big. You're like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. I have one of those um, cold steel. It's actually a folding knife, but the blade is like 12 inches. It's almost like a, <laughs> like a joke. <laughs> I'd lean, put that in the picture next to it. Yeah. It ends up being like a two handed yeah, knife. Like a giant sword. <laughs> <laughs> mushrooms like the size of your head, actually. <laughs> yeah. I collected 87 pounds of mushrooms. I did um I did pick over forty pounds of mushrooms one day though. It was, wow. It was like And mushrooms was, aren't dense like that. You could get a basket of mushrooms, it wouldn't weigh much. Yeah. No, these were big bolites and um and I had them in a big basket and like they literally the weight of the ones on top was crushing the ones on the bottom. Wow, yeah. So someone says, What kind of off road do you drive in the winter? What kind of off road vehicle? I assume so, yeah. Uh I I have been driving the same vehicle for seven years now i have a 15 year old toyota highlander hybrid um that just kind of keeps chugging along this, there's nothing special about it but i've taken it places with chris where we never should have taken that vehicle <laughs> um, and, it, and, and it made it <laughs> yeah people people i get a comment every once in a while about my soccer mom suv or this and that and, <laughs> Like, well, it, you know what it's gotten me in and out of everywhere i've tried to go right on um, it's all you need so, yeah no complaints that's it uh, let's see what's we got a couple questions here any advice on how to survive water disruption it's shtf snaring on jackson mississippi right now no water for two weeks wow filter and boil filter, filter and boil and i think um you know, if you're trying to keep your household running, like Mississippi, I don't, I'm not really great with my geography, but Mississippi gets a lot of rain, right? It's like, a, so if you can catch water to wash your dishes and then use your dishwater, uh, maybe filter it through a cloth and then use that to flush your toilets or use your shower water to flush your toilets, you can take the P3 
P-trap right off of your sink so that all your sink water, even when you're washing your hands or whatever, uh, if it's still running, if it's not, it's a different thing, but like just recapture and reuse that water in as many ways as you can. And then, and then put it out on your garden instead of flushing it. Um, yeah, double but, duty. Uh, filter, filter and boil. Uh, you know, if you don't have a, a specific water filter, you can use coffee filters and t-shirts and just get as much of the sediment out of it as you can. And then boiling is going to kill everything else. Uh, as long as you get it past 60, 60 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes, we'll kill most things. And that's not even a boil. Um, yeah. but we've talked about like the calcium hypochlorite before you can use to even the sun oven. If you're in a place with enough sun, you can basically pasteurize water in that by getting oh, yeah. it above the, so that's, there's lots of different things you can do. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I think people don't know that you don't have to get it to a boil to kill everything. Right. I think I, I don't know where it happened, but there was this rule and it's in a lot of older survival books. So you have to have the water at a, like a full boil for 10 minutes. And yeah. I'm like, that's not necessary. I'm like, but most of them, by the time you've gotten it to a boil, it's long killed anything. And I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with boiling it further in terms of a safety. But if, if you're in a situation where you have limited fuel for your fire or whatever heating element you're using. Yeah. You don't necessarily just want to, and it takes a lot of energy to boil water. You don't just want to sit there for 10 minutes with this big cauldron of water to boil. So yeah, yeah. The, usually by the time you get it to a boil, it's, um, it's well been. Yeah. And I think like, you know, you don't have to boil water in order to do your dishes, but you should boil water if you're going to brush your teeth with it. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to boil water to wash your hands in it. Right. So it's like, first off, knowing whether you need to boil or not is going to save you a ton of fuel and a ton of time. And then after that, it's really just like, filter and boil um you know go to a camp store get a good filter hardware right. stores carry filters you can even rig something you know like a lot of house filters Che, do you know anything about this like house filters for people who are on uh, wells like i have a house filter but it mostly works because my well is pushing 50 psi hmm. my well pump um but i don't know if there's a way to just drip filter through house filters, which are very easily commonly available at hardware stores. Yeah, I don't know if they need the pressure you're saying or if you could just use a little bit of a gravity system. I know there's certain filters that you can buy for that purpose, like the Berkey that are drip filters, but in terms of a normal house filter, if you need the water pressure or not, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah see, that's something I don't know about. It's, I'm not too sure myself. I mean, obviously, if, if you've got a premium filter or um, what's the, the reverse osmosis system, I mean, the, the more pressure you have, to push through something better. Uh, but as far as 50 PSI, I, if it was me, I'd be looking at um, a UV system personally, because that would, that's guaranteed to kill everything first off. And yeah. you're, you're, you're basically just limited to just basic filtration. Let's get rid of all the debris. Let's bring it down. If you can bring it down to 0 0.2, 0 0.2 micron is your bacteria. 0.002 is your, for viruses but if you bring it to 0.2 or excuse me two micron for bacteria and then you kill everything you only have viruses to contend with uv will take care of that then bob's your uncle as they say but mm -hmm. drip filtration i i don't have a lot of experience with oh. with you know, they do with, with if we're talking veg oil for fuel they've got these huge sauce that you, you put it in because the more real estate you have within the filtration system then the more the more product you can get at the end. So yeah. I'm not a particularly big fan because they seem to take forever. I, uh, take a lot longer. I have a, um, I have a gravity bag filter that I bought from Canadian tire, which, uh, in the States with, with Lowe's. You like the it's, survival you hang on the tree and you, you hang it on a tree mm -hmm. and it's got, um, it's got a, like a paper filter. They're, they're fairly inexpensive. They just screw in on the inside and then a gravity hose. They work fast. Especially like if you, and if you have sediment and you at least strain it through a t-shirt or something first to get rid of the big solids, yeah. you can, you can do, you know, on a hiking trip or a canoe trip, you can fill a couple of two liter water bottles in minutes um, when it's working properly. I, okay. Yeah. I know of them. I don't have a lot of experience with them. I know that there are some that you can, there's some sort of device where you can actively push it through. Yeah. Those, those are the, um, the ones that have like a ceramic filter. Usually you have to have a fair bit of pressure to, force the water through because they're like very fine filter right right Maybe even with activated carbon as well as a medium to go through this but i don't have a lot of experience with the gravity the, the ones that you're talking about just because yeah. 
I want water, uh, you know, now I'll use like a life straw or the, the UV light system, one of those portable ones of the SteriPen, I believe it's called. Oh, yeah. Um, which is which is actually very nice because when you want to drink, um, yes, filtration, boiling, we've all done that. But uh, it's not very nice to drink hot water when, when you're no, thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially if it's already like... Uh... You know, I know, yeah. Whatever, 75, 80 degrees Fahrenheit outside, and then you're drinking water that's just been boiled. It's yeah, it's not fun. It's not a not a fun feeling, no. Yeah, the gravity game, I played the boiling water way to a cools down game. Um SPQUR SPQR Cincinnati. I keep on thinking of that radio station when I see these guys. <laughs> I just question for you. I think we touched this so you're talking about the rice, but maybe. Yeah, before the rice, you said there was actually a struggle, I guess. So what was, I guess, just the wild edibles, the plants, I guess, would have been the biggest source of carbohydrates. Yeah. yeah. Source of carbohydrates. And also, what's the biggest unanticipated thing you learned in your year? Good question. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we we got the wild rice because we, we did try to go and harvest our own wild rice and we harvested a couple of root crop type things like dandelion roots and burdock roots but um you know and, and wild leeks and uh the dog tooth violets like they're just we just don't really have like a huge root crop except for cattails and um i have zero experience harvesting cattail roots and processing them and we just kind of never got around to doing it so the wild rice seemed like a good compromise in um something that we're able to purchase in bulk, but it's wild harvested and it's got like a, a rich, rich history in our part of the world in North America uh, with indigenous people who've been harvesting and managing wild rice for thousands and thousands of years. So um, that was a good fill in for us. Um, you know, we, we ate a lot of fiddleheads and wild leeks and, and then different, like I would say like yard weeds um, and uh you know, in hindsight, we should have maybe collected more of the uh, burdock roots because they're fairly easy to collect. And we should have really learned more maybe about ca uh, the cattail roots and how to harvest the starches out of them. Because um, we, had, we had a lot of acorns, but they're actually pretty high, high fat, high protein, um, less carbs. But, um, and, and actually, to, just to go along with that, before I answer that second question about the something that, that we weren't expecting to learn. Um, we were also using the ketogenic strips to see if we ever entered into ketosis because we were eating a very high meat diet and, and working pretty hard. Uh, and lots of people wondered if we were in ketosis, which we we never were really like, uh, we were just using like the pea strips that you pee on and they change color. Like I never saw a color change enough where I could confidently say, yes, I'm in ketosis today. Um, yeah, and we, we've mentioned this briefly when I think Bug Out Dam is on too, but for a lot of people, the you have to be pretty like below 20 grams of carbs for several days in a row before you'll actually be in like full ketosis. So it's not necessarily that surprising Yeah, to me anyway. Yeah, because we had carbs that like we, we had enough blueberries and raspberries and strawberries even to get us through the year. And then the other thing is carbs wise, like we we were eating maple syrup and maple sugar like it was going out of style. <laughs> we, uh, we probably had, I think we figured it was something like 50 or 60 liters of maple syrup that we oh. had through the year. <laughs> so awesome. I'm sure we got our 20 grams a day <laughs> yeah, right there. Right. Yeah, just For in maple sure. sugar. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the surprising things, I think we didn't anticipate uh, – at all, um, how much community support we would get from people we knew uh, and people we didn't know, and you know, people we knew who we didn't think would really be that interested, uh, and that was really amazing and really helpful through the year. So, you know, people who were who were offering to send us stuff, um, we got lots of moose meat from uh, friends and from Delphine's family. Uh, we had people, you know, in the states who were offering to send up wild game, and like, oh. I just don't think it can cross the border. Like I don't know enough about it. And, um, and that was, that was huge. And then just like people constantly cheerleading us on YouTube and, and people who checked in to all of our live streams and we're, we're really kind of rooting for us. That was, uh, that was huge. We, we didn't anticipate that. We thought people would be interested, but um, we didn't know that they would be that supportive. Awesome. 
speaking of community that I don't know what your uh, if you have a day job or what your situation is there, but was it did you have to like pack up like bear stew and dandelions or whatever for lunch? You'd be like, oh, no pizza for me. Thanks. I've got my bear meat. Yeah. <laughs> so what was that like? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was weird. So I, I uh, well, I work at a college. I'm a college professor and um, I got in trouble with my colleagues. Uh, one in particular is like, you, you cannot cook bear meat in the microwave anymore at work that's all fatty and stinking yeah, about yeah she'd had this really bad experience and the, and the smell of bear meat like instantly brought her back to this this horrible bear experience and it made her like sick to oh, her weird. stomach and um yeah so it was weird I, you know I, I definitely would have students who'd poke their head into the office and be like so what are you eating today and I'm like yeah the stew again you know it's, it's always stew it's bear stew or it's venison stew it's uh you know it was it was fairly fairly regular stuff i mean we had a we had over a hundred and over 160 species i think 150 species of things that we harvested like if you count up all the different animals and birds and plants and mushrooms and insects so we had a pretty good variety but things that made up like our main staples were fairly limited um right but, but a lot of it was stew well we always had a slow cooker going that was either cooking meat or cooking bones or you know just everything be became the next meal it just kept rolling over um you know and and actually a really hard part is because we uh both have kids so it was like you, you cook a regular meal for your kids and then you cook something totally different for you you know and they might be eating like grilled cheese sandwiches with ketchup and cake for dessert or whatever they're having and then you're eating bear again or raccoon and and my kids hated all my wild food like ah oh, it smells like dead bodies in the house so that's my uh, well right? technically <laughs> yeah yeah you technically it was dead a body and now it's yeah. dead <laughs> yeah yeah so um you know that was challenging too like and and just weird things like um you like you cook for your kids and then like you I never taste tested anything or you know you like you get your finger on the pasta sauce by accident so you just yeah. like lick it if nobody's looking and then I you know you'd get it to your mouth and you'd be like oh wait a second that's not wild pasta sauce yeah exactly. and we were like we we're super strict you know that's as strict cool. as we could be on eating wild food for the whole year it's awesome. Yeah, I tend to like a lot of the gamier foods like that, so I'm I'm, I'm curious to try raccoon and these other things well toronto raccoon is not is disgusting that's all I <laughs> a different story um i think michael asked something about micron size don't quote me on this i think it's 0.2 micron for bacteria and i want to say 0 0.004 for viruses but that's we're, i don't want to get into that but since we're talking about water mm -hmm. jeremy was that your drink for the whole what what did you drink it was was oh. it just like that yeah. was that. Yes. So not only was that our drink for the whole year, but we did not drink municipal treated tap water. We only drank wow. filtered well water, um, which meant that like every week, uh, Delphi and I would haul jugs of water to her house from my house. And, and we only cooked and drank uh, that well water. So no chlorinated water, no fluorinated water, except um, a couple times when we were stranded somewhere without our own water but uh you know we we drank um dandelion root coffee pretty much every morning and with maple syrup <clears throat> and um we would make herbal teas we i still have uh plants that i dried in the big wild year in my cupboard that i didn't end up making tea with but like goldenrod and um yarrow and white pine and cedar and rose hips and rose petals. Um, we just had just tons of different herbal teas that we would be made. I always had a big, big casserole dish on my wood stove and it always had tea in it. And then I would just scoop out all the old gross leaves and then just throw new stuff in and just keep this teapot going perpetually, it felt like. There's a question from emergency survival tips. And the question is, did you grow any vegetables? Did you have a garden? Did you grow anything? Was I had a garden, but I, um, the only things I ate out of the garden were the weeds. Um, so I, you know, I gardened cause I, I like to garden a bit and, uh, for my kids cause they love to eat everything in the garden before it's actually ripe. Look at all these cucumbers I picked. And they're like this big, <laughs> right? And like, if you wait, they'll get bigger um so i know we didn't it was all wild uh you know like we picked a lot of um 
in, from the garden, I picked a lot of lamb's quarters, which is a weed, uh, the wild spinach or the pigweed, we call it, which is a weed, uh, purslane, which, which you can, people do grow it on purpose, but it comes up in our garden as a wild weed. Um, and uh, there's one that I can picture, but I forget the name of it anyway. But so I was picking weeds out of my garden, um, but it, we never ate any garden food. It was uh, everything was was wild or feral. So like we picked a lot of um, a lot of wild apples. Um, we came down to ha harvest gathering, and um, there were uh, was it that week or a different week? Um, there, there were tons of wild apples growing along the roadsides. Right, like we we picked two hundred pounds of apples one afternoon and wow. took them all home and made applesauce and ate apples and ate more apples and. I don't think anybody ate more apples than us for that month of September or October. Cool. Moving on. So what would your advice be? We're getting near our hour mark here, but just to start wrapping it up, would, would you have any sure. advice for people who are trying to do a similar type of experiment or lifestyle, I guess, to even be more? Yeah, well, I would say like um, you got to, you got to work up to it and you really have to plan and know uh, when all your different seasons are because um, there are some things that like are only pickable or collectible in a certain time frame. And then you have to know what to do with them. So you might, you might know that you can pick blueberries and you pick them every year, but if you go and you pick 40 or 60 pounds of blueberries, like you got to know what your game plan is with them. Cause if you don't have enough freezer space or, you know, you, you don't know how to preserve them without sugar or whatever it is. Um, there are lots of little, tricks and tips that you're you're going to want to know and um, you can't always count on uh your hunting seasons either like uh it seems easy enough to go get a bear until you actually are counting on getting a bear and then um, it can be really frustrating when it doesn't go the way you want so it's uh True. it's good good to plan ahead and good to stockpile food ahead um there's a there's a couple in canada right now i saw somebody sent me a news flash about them and they were but theirs is uh, grown, like picked and foraged, but uh, they also have a garden. And um, there's a guy in Florida that did something similar the same year, 2019. He did uh, uh, a garden a garden and a foraged year. Rob Greenfield, I think. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, and also live on the live on the coast would be a good one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, fishing is an easy way to get a lot of... Uh... Yeah, and lobsters and crabs and abalones and all those tasty things from the ocean. Yeah, shrimp, everything. Yeah. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, there are just like are some areas that are um, just have less stuff, right? Than than lots of other areas. Like like here, I'm out in the desert. There's really yeah, yeah. not that many options. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, but you're on the coast, right? No, I'm in the middle of the desert, basically, Las Vegas. Yeah, right. Oh, okay. So I'm about five hours from any coast, yeah. Oh. There's oh, not much water doing? out here of any kind. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what are you doing there? Gambling? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's uh you just really like to live in sin. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've talked about this before too. Like if you um if you're talking about a, a major survival situation, the inhospitable places have a kind of an advantage and disadvantage. Like obviously, there's less availability of any natural resource. But if everyone else is going to die off to, you know, really quickly, yeah, yeah. you don't have, to, don't have to worry about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. If it's somewhere that's really easy to live with lots of natural resources, it's easier for everyone else to live too. So, yeah, yeah. The problem for me is like, you know, everybody I know or even don't know, they're like, ah, there's ever a problem. I'm going to Jeremy's house. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, we've all heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> Like it's my bear stew. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at something too, where Jeremy's at, North Bay, it's every every other person's a hunter up there. It's, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, and there's lots of lots of crown land, which is nice up here, like a fairly low population and a huge expanse of uh, crown land. You can you yeah. go out and not see other people if you if you want to go and be on your own for sure. Yeah, lots of great hunting opportunities. So Jeremy, you rock, man. This is fun. Thanks for <laughs> Yeah, it was great. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. This has been fun. Yeah, it was a blast. Appreciate it. I'm going to post your Facebook link for Big Wild Year. Okay. And One Wildcraft. Uh, sorry, your channel, One Wildcrafter. 
your YouTube channel. I just did that in the chat window for people that uh, are interested in learning more, getting or connecting with Jeremy. So thanks for joining us. And do you have any last uh, yeah, my things pleasure. or, or uh, talk to the, to mention to the audience? How would you like to conclude things? This sure. Uh, yeah, one thing that um, sometimes doesn't come up, like that I like to mention, just because it's not all sunshine and roses, because uh, we did see lots of great health benefits, but um, we specifically measured blood mercury because mercury is a common contaminant in uh, aquatic uh, food chains. And so it's in, present in a lot of fish. And um, my mercury level at the start of the year was basically already borderline uh, at the legal um, or suggested level. And then it went up 10 times Ooh. the uh, amount. So from uh, something like 20 or 30, I always get the units mixed up, mixed up. It's like micrograms per liter of blood. It went up to like 329. Like it was uh, definitely gave my doctor a shock. Um, wow. <laughs> So, you know, you should be aware of, of some of those contaminants. So like moose livers and things that you can get a lot of cadmium. And then uh, if you're eating fatty, fatty fish and contaminated waters, you can get a lot of mercury, but otherwise like. Incredible. So that's we're primarily from the, the fish that you were getting. I, I can only assume so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know else I would... You know, you're around here. Yes. But North Bay, further North you go, you would think it would be a cleaner environments. No, because a lot of our uh, water systems have been impacted by uh, re like water hydroelectric development, and that's that um, basically releases mercury that's that's in the soil. When you flood it all, um, it works its way out of the soil into the aquatic food chain, and then um, the other major source of mercury, I think, is air pollution. So, like, we no nobody can escape air pollution, right? It goes with the air. So there's um, uh, whatever it is, it's been 60, 70, 80 years of uh, hydroelectric development and smelting operations and vehicle emissions all contributing to mercury in the environment. Sad. Wow. Yeah. But, no. um, but the wild animal fats and all the protein and, you know, those healthy uh, wild greens and um, inulin containing uh, root crops, they, they all otherwise seem to be very, very healthy for us. Excellent. I appreciate it. Thanks everyone also for watching as well. We'll definitely have to have you back at some point, especially if you get more stories of finding amazing uh, legal loopholes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are always a common or uh, popular topic. <laughs> yeah. And if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, jump back and rewatch this at the beginning of the video. If you came in late, it's got a good story. <laughs> so appreciate everyone. Thanks for watching and we will see you guys next week.